one. You can see that right now you're looking at the milling machine and I want to do something to any piece of equipment. All right, let's just get this one over with. Is my head even in the shot? Hello. Welcome back to STFU's Telecorrespondence Remote Training, where now is the future. You are viewing tape number 21, cutting internal threads in titanium bungs. As in tapes 1 through 20, when you see this graphic appear on your screen, pause the playback device and follow the exercise in your handbook. When finished, press the play button on the device to continue. Present your identification card to the storeroom clerk to withdraw all training materials and a titanium blank. In the interest of time, and so that you may concentrate exclusively on cutting internal threads, the shop foreman will have already reamed your bung. Please observe all safety procedures and notify the shop. Quick video, I think. Let me get you up to speed on what, in theory, is going to happen. This is a threaded aluminum cap, like a gas cap, really, but it could be for anything. And this is a matching threaded aluminum bung. This part is meant to be installed and welded in or on whatever container you need cap access to. Like if you're making an alcoholic sized whiskey flask, you can get some three inch stainless pipe, weld both ends shut, then install this weld on wide mouth. Let's be honest, who wants a regular cap slowing you down? Except this is aluminum and it won't weld to stainless. Not for very long anyway. I suppose you could make your comedy sized flask out of aluminum. Then you could weld this. But as we all learned in the that's not an espresso pot video, aluminum causes... Ah, what was that? If you watch this channel, odds are pretty good you already know Aaron over at 6061.com. He's like the mattress king of welding aluminum. I can think of no higher praise than that. Except for this project, he won't be welding aluminum. He wants to weld titanium. Which is where I come in. The plan is to replicate one or two of these threaded bungs in titanium instead of aluminum, which he plans to use for a super strong, super light fuel bottle of some kind. I'll add the link to his video down below when it's out. Does that come across on video? Those are aluminum, this is titanium. Sort of the luster is a little bit different. It's almost like stainless, maybe a little more gunmetal grayish. It is crazy light too. Full disclosure, except for my double hip replacements, I have very limited experience in machining titanium, bordering on zero. And even that was mill work, not lathe work, which is what this project will be. Pro tip, always lead with an opener like that, that you have zero experience doing something, but to make up for it, you're super excited and would bring a ton of enthusiasm to the table. Anyway, since I was the lowest bidder, my lack of experience didn't seem to phase Aaron much. In fact, he sent me what's gotta be close to $50 in raw material. Job shop cutoffs from the look of them. Not to be confused with these job shop cutoffs. Since this would be an otherwise short video, let's milk some details that could have otherwise been left unsaid. Before I race you to the lathe, let's take a few dimensions so it looks like I know what I'm doing. First step for me is to identify these threads. If I were making both parts, it might not matter. But since this cap needs to fit the new bungs, I need to know what the thread is. And in my case, if my lathe can cut those threads. Which it can. They turn out to be a very popular 12 TPI. Which is pretty close to about a 2 millimeter pitch for you metric folks. 2.54 divided by 12 is 2 and some change. Next we need to know the thread diameter. That looks like a one and a quarter inch thread. So the new titanium parts need to accept a one and a quarter inch 12 thread. The amazing vernier calipers. Often referred to in the plural, calipers are a most singular tool indeed. With only one moving part, no batteries or transistors. This wonder of the metrological world allows us to measure down to sizes scientists previously posited could not exist. If you can do some figuring in your head and own an electron microscope capable of reading the scales, you too can read down to one thousandths of an inch, less than the thickness of a human hair, in the comfort of your own home and privacy of your own bathroom. In the future, every man, woman, and child will carry their own veneer caliper wherever they go. So let's learn just how easy these are to use. This particularly advanced model can provide both inch and metric measurements simultaneously. What will science think of now? Given its worldwide use, let's start with the immensely more popular imperial measurement, in this case located on the top scale. Again, these offer a resolution 
of one one thousandth of an inch. This is the main scale and this is the vernier scale. Please notice for this particular measurement the zero of the vernier scale is well past the one inch mark on the main scale. Therefore this threaded cap is larger than one inch and just like that the first puzzle piece falls into place. Upon closer inspection an attentive metrologist may notice the zero mark is not only past the major one inch division but also past the one tenth and two tenths marks. Our second puzzle piece is now in place. The plot thickens indeed. If that weren't astounding enough, this is where the magic really happens. The space between the one tenths divisions, between the two and the three in this case, is further divided into four more divisions. Since we're dividing one tenth of an inch into four parts, each one of those divisions must be twenty-five thousandths of an inch. Is it a coincidence that the largest number on our vernier scale is 25? I leave that to you, dear viewer. To conclude our measurement, and to learn where our answer lies in that gaping chasm between 1.2 and 1.225, we simply find the line on our vernier scale that coincides perfectly with a line on our main scale. Scanning from left to right, we see that the 10 line, or 11 line perhaps, match up quite nicely. To my eye, the 11 appears to be a better match. The 11 in this position is 11 thousandths of an inch. And there we have it, my friends. Our threaded cap measures 1.211 inches. Incredible. As a courtesy to our metric friends, let's quickly read the other scale. Here the resolution is 2 hundredths of a millimeter. The zero mark of the metric vernier is past 30 millimeters, but not quite to 31 millimeters. To find where our measurement is in that space, we move to the vernier scale, again trying to find two marks that best line up. In this case, it appears to be the third line after the seven. Since each mark on this side of the vernier is two hundredths of a millimeter, the third mark is two plus two plus two, or six hundredths of a millimeter. And just like that, our now metric threaded cap is 30.76 millimeters. I enjoy challenge as much as the next lazy guy, but I'm not particularly looking forward to this. Here's what I remember about titanium. It's sort of like machining stainless, in that it really likes to work hard. Speeds and feeds need to be right on the money, and you can't let up. In a cut, you can't let off pressure. As soon as you hesitate, if your tool rubs, the material will harden and it's game over. The other factoid I know about titanium is that it really likes to heat up. And if that weren't enough, it has a lousy thermal conductivity. Combine that with needing a constant tool pressure, and we've got a potential disaster brewing. All that is to say we'll need a ton of coolant, maybe an air blast, and a very rigid machine. They don't call this the Widowmaker alloy for nothing. Let's see what happens. It's all fun and games in the edited video, but drilling that pilot hole was brutal. This piece of titanium just ate my drill bit alive. The business end is just melted and worn away. I think when I got too deep, I just didn't have the coolant pressure to get in there to cool the tip of the tool and help flush those chips out. And despite the coolant that I did have, everything got smoking hot. Most materials, or I should say most metals you probably run into in a home shop, during machining, lose all of their heat in the chips, or a large percentage of their heat in the chips. So if you're clearing chips, the heat's getting out of the work. This zany titanium is just the opposite. The chips are coming out cool. All of the heat is staying in the workpiece, and consequently cooking my tools. Burning up this drill took a split second. By the time that happened, the material inside had work hardened. There was no way I was going to push through that with another high-speed steel drill bit. So I resorted to carbide. I also found that this thicker cutting fluid, this honey-like sulfur-based stuff, was doing a lot better. But even this, down in that hole, was just vaporizing. Now, like stainless, if you get an area that's work-hardened, if you have a tool that can cut through that, that can get past that, most times it can dig its way past that work-hardened area, and you can save the work. The problem now is having to open that pilot hole up to about an inch, a little bigger than an inch. And I don't have carbide tooling that large. So this next step is going to stink.
That went shockingly well, probably because the larger drill made enough room to really get that coolant down in there. I drilled it through and through and cleaned up the last 40 or 50 thou with a boring bar, still with flood coolant, and it's now right on size, ready for threading. While drilling, I did stop every, I don't know, three quarter inch or so, every 15 to 20 millimeters to sharpen the drill. Just touch the edges up. You can tell in the chips where the edge started to break down. They've sort of got these wispy, additional chips riding along with them versus the clean ones with a sharp edge, with a sharp edge on the drill. I did bump the tailstock handle just to break these chips, but was careful not to let the drill rub in the bore. And these things are so light, it's surreal. That one's pretty. Next, I need to grind a thread cutting tool, a tool for cutting internal 60 degree threads. You'd think after all these years, I'd have plenty of these laying around. They just always seem to get repurposed for something else. This is a half inch high speed steel blank and forming this is gonna take some work. Say toodaloo to your granddad's low speed steel. Introducing high speed steel. Now is the future. High speed steel is a member of the tool steel family. Composed primarily of one part H and two parts S, it's a very tough and very hard all purpose steel for all your modern tool making needs. Available in a multitude of fun shapes and sizes, high speed steel blanks can be formed into lathe and mill tooling, drills and reamers, the sky's the limit. In this lesson, you'll need an internal 60 degree threading tool. First, clean your blank with spirits. For your convenience, the storeroom stocks 20 gallon containers of methyl benzene. As a rough guide, draw the shape of the tool you intend to make. Do not attempt to form high speed steel using hand files. Doing so will result in your immediate dismissal. Instead, use a suitable abrasive to break down the tool steel. And just like that, in only a few months time, your patients will be rewarded with a passable looking lathe tool that probably works pretty all right for what you need anyway. My intention was to thread this entire blank in one operation, then cut off five or six parts, whatever I could get out of this stock Aaron sent me. But now I'm starting to wonder if it's too much for my threading tool, or my lathe for that matter. If the work hardens on me, I'm gonna end up with a tapered thread in the best case scenario. Worst case, of course, is having to throw the whole thing away, sulk for a couple of days and start over. So although it's more work, I think I'm gonna cut the parts to size first, then come in and thread them one at a time. It's four or five times more setup, but I think the odds of me getting a good threaded part are much higher. The other downside, of course, is I'll be taking this work and putting it back in the chuck four or five times. The threads I cut might not be on the same axis that this part is bored to. But luckily, this is a gas cap. So as long as those threads pull the seal closed, it shouldn't really matter. Just a moment ago, when your mind wandered and you were thinking about that other thing, I took the opportunity to size the blanks that I cut off, cut them all to length, and cut recesses in each end one for the O-ring and one for the locating shoulder. So they've all got an O-ring groove and a locating shoulder in the back. And now it's time to cut the threads. Just figured you'd want to know. Again, I need to cut 12 TPI threads in these parts. That's 12 threads per inch because the cap is 12 TPI. Every linear inch of part needs 12 of those thready things. And 12 threads for every inch means each thready thing is spaced about 83 thousandths of an inch apart. In machine setup terms, and to recap my half hour thread cutting video, we have to set up the lathe in this case so that for every turn of the chuck, every turn of the work, the tool we just ground moves 83 thousandths of an inch. One full turn here, 83 thou there. Got it? There are two ways you could do this. First, you could take apart your lathe's headstock and gearbox and count all the gear teeth between the machine spindle and the lead screw. Do the math and keep changing the gears until you get the 12 TPI relationship you want. Alternatively, you could just set your lathe to 12. The 
According to my calculations, that should be it. I'm gonna try the cap in there. I hope to be in that sweet spot, somewhere between the cap won't thread in and the cap falls completely through the part. I don't know, a little bit tighter might have been nice. I think if I had stopped two or three thousand shy of that last pass, I might have been happier with the fit. Though honestly, it feels just like the factory aluminum one. I cut the female thread depth, I think like to the book. I'm wondering if these on the cap are cut just a little bit loose. I'm going to call that good. And by good, I mean not scrap. Yeah, that's fine. It's a gas cap for crying out loud, not an ICBM nose cone. If you watched a lot of Looney Tunes growing up, you'll know ICBM nose cones are threaded on too. One down, three more to go. Hold on, one more thing. The factory part has a rounded lead in. So they broke this edge with a nice radius. I'd like to replicate that. To do so, I've made a form tool with that same radius. All right, fine, almost the same radius. I cut that profile into a piece of high-speed steel with the closest carbide end mill I had. Let's see how form tools do in titanium. Hold on, I've got to lock my carriage. It's pushing the tool away. Not a perfect radius, but not too shabby. That's more like it. I'd almost go so far as to call that passable. And those look to be some respectable chips too. All right. One down, three more to go. Machining titanium stinks. It stinks the whole time you're machining it, but it's awesome once you're finished. Everything gets hot, your tools wear out, the chips won't break, but just look at those things. I should also mention titanium swarf is a fire hazard, like fine titanium shavings. I think it's a fire hazard anyway. I did have a few instances of my chips sparking bright white at the cutting edge, kind of like magnesium, but fortunately no fire. And just because I didn't burst into flames doesn't mean you won't, so be careful. Aaron only really wanted one of these things, but he sent me two pieces of stock. I suppose he thought it was in case I screwed up the first eight parts before getting to one good one. Frankly, I was offended at the suggestion. Then again, I did wait until all these parts were finished before telling you that. With the second piece of stock, I made this. This, obviously, is a whiskey flask coupler. I figured he might like a titanium cap instead of this absurdly heavy aluminum one. Except the raw stock is a little small to make a fun cap. You see, the cap is larger than the stock I received. I'd need something just a little bit bigger. According to the machinery's handbook, my options for an industry standard cap, besides lobes like this one, or maybe knurls, include a skull, a cobra head, or an eight ball, none of which I have material for on this diameter. So I'll just send it along like this. He can cut this off, maybe make two. Perhaps he has some ideas I don't. Maybe he could build up the OD with some sick looking weld beads. That'd be sick. Bro. And that would be about it for this video, if it weren't for one last thing. First word that jumps to mind, consistent. I guess I should leave this kind of stuff to the pros. I hope I didn't totally ruin his parts. But I know he's going to be welding these, so they weren't going to stay silver for very long. Just having titanium on hand, I couldn't resist trying to oxidize them. That, and I needed a good thumbnail. Congratulations, you have completed tape number 21. I look forward to seeing the remaining three of you in tape number 22, building your own surface gauge. Please rewind this tape before enclosing it in the postage paid return envelope. And as always, thanks for watching.